Okay, I'm very glad to be here talking about this topic and seeing all this like I'm very much looking forward to this other presentation because there's going to be like interesting line of scholars talking about this philosophy and psychological meaning. And myself, I'm going to be talking about this distinction between meaning of life and meaning in life. And to start off, like when we think about the question of meaning of life, we quite often think, think about it as some kind of like, you know, this eternal question that has been asked since the dawn of mankind. But is it really such a question that has been asked like since the dawn of mankind? So like a few years ago, I started like investigate the matter, trying to like figure out who were the first people who actually like used the phrase meaning of life. And it turned out like actually it's, it's not an eternal question. <laughs> That's why I want to use my own laptop because then I have all these Mac MacBook effects instead of like this PowerPoint. <laughs> so it's, it's actually not a question like that has been like asked since the dawn of mankind, but actually quite a recent invention. In fact, like in the English language, it's probably this guy who first used the phrase meaning of life. And this guy is Thomas Carlyle, who in 1834 wrote his like, famous novel Sartor Resartus, which was like one of the most influential novels in the 19th century British literature. And it was like, influenced like, everybody from Thomas, like, Her Herman Melville to like, Emerson and so forth. And in this book, like, one of the key passages of the book, we find this sentence where he says so, that our life is compassed round with necessity, yet is the meaning of life itself no other than freedom. And what he means by this sentence is like kind of like that, that we, as, as human beings, we have, we are, have like this, all these like necessities. We, have, we need to get food on the table. We need to get water and so forth. But like what makes us unique as human beings is that we can also follow some higher motives in our lives. And in following those higher motives in our life, in freedom to follow those higher motives in our life, th there, is the, there do we find this like this meaning of life. But it was not only like Thomas Carlyle who started like talk about this topic of meaning of life during approximately in the like early 19th century. But when we look at the German language or German, German literature, we find Arthur Schopenhauer as one of the first persons to talk about Sinn des Lebens, which translates into meaning of life. He mentioned it like briefly in the, in the book Die Welt als Willes und Vorstellung. And then he like talked about it a bit more in the book Parerka und Parali Pomena, where he like was like arguing that perhaps life doesn't have any meaning at all. And in the, in the Danish language, quite much at the same time, Søren Kierkegaard, like, which is, who is of, often considered like one of the first existentialists, he was in one of his books like in 1834, like saying that, min bedragting ab libet er aldeles meningslös, which it translates into, my view of life is totally meaningless. So clearly there was like something happening in the like early 19th century, like about, which made this like question of meaningfulness like salient. And to understand what that was, we might compare these thinkers with, like, with earlier thinker, with Aristotle. Because in one of like, the most famous books of the like, Western philosophy, the Nicomachean Ethic, Aristotle is like, what, what, is looking, what he's looking for in the book is like, the, what is the highest human good? So some end of our actions that we wish for an account of itself. And then he, like, then he goes on to, like, to discuss like, various candidates for what, what could this be, this like this end of our actions or highest human good, and he thinks about pleasure, my good pleasure might not be that thing, then he th thinks about virtue and so forth. And what I'm not like, interested in here is not, what, not, not his answer to the question, but rather that what he is not asking in the book. And what he's not asking is that he never questioned whether humans have a good or an end. Like that was taken as a self-evident fact that, you know, of course, like he was living in this like rational cosmos, everything in the, in the world had like some purpose, everything, everything had like some, something, some purpose, like every plant, every animal had some purpose. So of course, then human beings also have some purpose. So the only thing that we have to figure out is like what this purpose is by like figuring out what is specific about humans compared to other animals. And this like, and compared to this, like then this Carlyle, Schopenhauer, Kierkegaard, they were actually like, like but the question that they were interested in is that whether life has meaning or at all, does it, does it have any like purpose at all? And they were like, kind of like even like going through this kind of existential crisis where they were, like, were, were afraid that life might not have any meaning and then they were trying to like come up with some way of finding meaning in life. So what was then like happening in the 19th century that made this question so salient? Of course, there's like many developments in that time, you know, industrialization, urbanization, democratization of governments and so forth. But I would argue that the most important development that, like, that contributed to this, this crisis of meaning, that this, like, this idea that life might not, be me might not be, like, have any meaning, was the scientific worldview, but it was, it was like, becoming stronger and stronger. 
And I'd argue that like the scientific worldview was what was what led to this disenchanted mechanistic universe. That suddenly we were not like part of this meaningful cosmos, but the universe was governed by these natural laws, these cold and mechanistic laws, and human beings were just, just this like random accident that happened to happen in this small remote planet in some remote corner of the universe. So before that, cosmos was rational, everything had a place in it, and suddenly we had this scientific worldview, which was like kind of challenging this, this belief, and leading us to realize that the world, world might not contain objective meaning or objective value. And even today, we can like see this, like this influence of science in our, like, in, in our experiences of meaning, because I guess like many of you have like seen this kind of like graphic before, so like if, if you look at the life satisfaction of people and if you look at the wealth of the nations, we tend to find the, like a positive correlation. The wealthier the nation, the more, peop more prone are people to report that they are satisfied with their lives. And in this statistic, like Denmark was number one, but nowadays Finland has been number one. I just have to <laughs> ma mention that. <laughs> but then actually recently, there was like this, these researchers, Oishi and Diener, they got their hands on this Gallup World Poll, which includes also this question about meaningfulness. Do you feel your life has an important purpose or meaning? And when they look at how that question is like, kind of like related to like the gross domestic product per capita of the nations, they write the opposite correlation. It was actually the richer countries tended to be the countries where people were more, more prone to say that their life didn't, didn't have any meaning in life. And then when they were trying to look for like explanations for this, why, why is this the case that like richer people, richer countries tend to have more people who don't find their life meaningfulness, meaningful, they found like one explanation and the explanation was expo specific, specifically religiosity, that richer countries on average tend to be countries which are less religious countries, and less religious countries tend to be countries where more people are questioning the meaning of their life. So we might say that, you know, for a long time in the Western history, the question that we were like, the, the grand question about life that we were asking was the question of the end of man, summum bonum in the Latin, Latin language. And that was the question about human life asked for most of Western history up until the 20th century, according to the Professor Joshua Hochschild. And then came the, me the question of meaning of life. And that was the question that was like more this kind of like reaction to the 19th century, like reaction that, to the potentially meaning and valueless universe. So the first question requires this rational cosmos to be like sensible. And the second question is like this reaction yearning for objectivity. And kind of like what I'm arguing that like perhaps we, we should like kind of like rethink the question because like, if you take this, like, this more scientific worldview towards our values, first the values are not out there, but look more akin to what Sharon Street has like, said that before life began, nothing was valuable. But then life arose and began to value, not because it was recognizing anything, but because creatures who valued certain things in particular tended to survive. So valuing is not something that, values are not something out there in the world, in the universe, but they're not more something that we have as, as, as like, biological creatures, we tend to value certain things. And if you take this perspective on value, values, I think that like, instead of this like, search for alternative sources of objectivity, we might like, re rethink the question and focus on these values that we have already within ourselves. So like, there's like, two ways of asking this question of mean meaningfulness in life. So one is this like, objective meaning of life, which means like, this, like, that trying to figure out what, what, is, what, what, are the, what, what are the things like beyond human beings that make life meaningful. So something like, you know, that is not dependent of, of, of us valuing it that could make our lives valuable and meaningful. And then there's the question of, like this more subjective question of meaning in life, which is a question about my own life, about whether I feel that my life is somehow meaningful. And so like one, one is looking, at, looking for meaning like out there in the world, somehow like some, some kind of like meaning, meaning which is like not dependent on human, value, human valuing them, and the other is like actually focusing on this human valuing process. <laughs> and what I'm kind of like arguing that this, like this question of meaning in life is the question that we should, should be asking today, because like that's a question that is more compatible and easier to like fit together with the scientific worldview. And as regards this question of meaning in life, then like so what, what, what is it? It's, like, it's a subjective experience. It's something that we experience as regards our own life. So like, as Jean-Paul Sartre said, it's we who give life meaning and value is nothing more than the meaning we give it. So like, it's something that we experience as regards our own life. So we can like, experience more meaning in our life, we can experience less meaning in, life, in our lives. And, most, like, and more specifically, what, what kind of like, experience this meaningfulness is, is so as, as like, 
we heard in the last presentation, there has been like different ways of like conceptualizing meaning, like as, as comprehension, purpose, significance, and so forth, mattering. But I, I would like argue that the most broadly, most broad like conceptualization of like this, what this experience of meaning is, is about like experiencing mm -hmm. one's life as worthy and valuable. So in essence, like feeling that my life is worth living. So that's like the most fundamental ex experience. And then like, you know, having a purpose or having comprehension in one's life might be like things that like might contribute towards that. But like the most fundamental thing that we, we can like, the most fundamental evaluation that we can make about our own life is about experiencing it, it as valuable in some way. And as regards like this, like this distinction between objective and subjective meaning, I would argue that now that if you find your life valuable and worth living, that's enough. That there's like no need for like objectivity beyond that, that that my own life. That if I'm able to somehow like feel that my life is valuable, I don't need to need to like look for any object objectivity to make it even more valuable. But as a subjective experience, like if this meaningfulness then is a subjective experience, something that I experience as regards my own life, then like the argument is that like one can in principle find meaning wherever one is able. So like, let's take one example, Woody Allen in the movie Manhattan, or the character played by Woody Allen, who just happens to resemble very much the real life Woody Allen. <laughs> so in one, one point of the movie, he's asking himself this question, like what makes my life meaningful? And then he like thinks for a while, and then he comes up with this list. Groucho Marx, Willie Mays, the famous baseball player, the sacred movement of the Jupiter Symphony, Louis Armstrong's recording of the Potato Head Blues, Swedish movies, Sentimental Education by Flaubert, Marlon Brando, Frank Sinatra, Apples and Pears by Cezanne, the grabs at Sam Woos, and the Tracy's face, and Tracy being his girlfriend in the movie. So, and who am I to argue that, you know, that to, to Woody Allen that, no, these things can't make your life worth living, you know? How, how can I go, go there and say that, you know, Frank Sinatra, no, that doesn't, like, make your life meaningful? <laughs> so, in a sense, like, there seems to be, like, some kind of, like, this idiosyncrasy to meaning, meaningfulness, that like every people, every human being might have like different, different things that make their lives worthy and meaningful. But the pro that, that's a, a bit of a problem because like we want to want more from meaning than like anything goes. We want like to say more about meaningfulness than just that, you know, like if you happen to value that thing, then that's fine. If you happen to value that thing, that's fine. You know, one example that the philo philosophers use about this thing is like that like if some person finds like counting the blades of grass on the field of y Har Harvard Yard meaningful, then like we want to be able to say to that person, no, that's actually not meaningful. <laughs> we, we want to be able to say to that person that, you know, like every day going there and counting the blades of grass doesn't make any sense. It's not, it can't be a meaningful experience. <laughs> <clears throat> so we want like something more than the subjective, like that is, that is something more than, you know, just, in, just anything goes. And what we actually want is like that values that are somehow like justified, that have like some like reasoning behind and something that makes them like more justified than just like any, 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 anything at all. And one way to like justify values is of course like then like to try to figure out what are the objective values. If some values would be like objective, that would be like one good way of justifying them. But what I'm like arguing here that in, in addition to that, we can like try to even like within the subjectivist framework, we can try to like somehow seek justification for values and not like from out there from the objective objective world but more like within us and more particularly i kind of like argue that in the quest for meaning we are stuck in our human nature so like despite despite there being like some idiosyncrasies as re regards like our sources of meaning like one one for one person it might be like the marilyn brando one another person it might be something else but there seems to be like actually quite much commonality in our intuitions about what makes life meaningful now, when people are asked like to name what, what one t one thing that makes their life meaningful, most people usually like tend to tend to name you know one member of the family or like some some close relationship they have. So it seems to be like you know that close relationships are quite universally co considered as like one of the key sources of meaning in life. And moreover, like it seems that you know we are stuck in our human nature to the degree that like we can even like we cannot like escape our human nature even if, if we want to. Like one example of this is like Dostoevsky's book Crime and Punishment where this like this main character Raskolnikov, he decided that he's like, he was like this young and bold man. And he decided that he's like above the like petty morality of his time. And instead like he, had, he was living like according to his own standards and according to his own, own standards, he realized that killing this certain like greedy landlord would be like good, morally good thing. So th then he went out and killed that landlord. 
And the, actually, the book is not about the murder itself, but like what happens after the murder, and more particularly, what happens to Raskolnikov, like and what, what happens within the mind of the Raskolnikov after the murder. Because he starts to feel guilt, he starts to be like very like, he, he becomes like quite devastated after, after the fact. And, and that's and kind of like the point that Dostoevsky was trying to make through his book was that, you know, that we can try to escape our morality and, and certain like values through, through rationalization, but actually we, we are not able to do it. That our, our nature is stronger than our, our, our reasons. So like even though we like on a certain level could, could try to like argue, like argue against certain values, these values still matter for us. So like our, our human nature makes certain values and sources of meaning more natural to, to us than others. So like certain, certain sources of meaning and values are very natural to us and other things we, we, have, we have a hard time to value even if, if we tried. And this means like that, that this is not about like this objective universalism, like we cannot use the hu human nature to argue that you know, something is objective, but rather it's like this empirical universalism that like, we can like use the scientific method to figure out what are like the most typical ways of that human beings tend to find meaning and that we can accept some, some level of act, like exceptions that there might be some people some, in some situation who don't find meaning in that thing, but most people in most situations find meaning in that thing. And I argue that that's kind of like enough, that this empirical universal is, is enough and we have to like accept that there might be exceptions to any sources of meaning. And then if you want to like investigate what could be like good sources of meaning in that, that, in that sense, we might have to look at this like, we could like look at this research on like basic motivation and disposition and, and basic psychological needs. So like it's quite self-evident that humans have like certain like physical needs, that basic physical needs like need for like water or food and so forth. But what the psychologists are arguing that like in addition to those things we also have like these basic psychological needs. Certain things that like are so like necessary for us that we have like developed, that we have like evolved this tendency to seek out these experiences and then we are, when we are able to like get these experiences we feel this sense of like satisfaction. So like this, this basic psychological needs then have like, like evolved like ensure that we get from our environment of certain crucial psychosocial experiences and they are like seen as like necessary for healthy development and well-being and satisfaction then tends to lead to like short-term well-being and also like long-term well wellness in terms of like you know mental health and even physical health and so forth. And their frustration tends to lead to ill-being. And being like psychological needs, being something that which is part of our human nature means that those, they're also like universal. So they're like operational across cultures. Mm -hmm. And then when, when we like have this like idea of like basic psychological needs, we might make this distinction between like these needs and on the one hand and then like on these intrinsic values on the other hand. So these needs are like implicit. There's something that we don't have to be like consciously aware of for them to like play a role in our lives. Whether we know that we have these needs, they, they still like make certain things intuitively appealing to us. They make certain, when, when we get these needs satisfied, they increase our well-being, whether we know that we have this need or not. And they're the same to all human beings. Then there are these intrinsic values, which mean, which with, I mean, like values that we have like consciously chosen, something like which are like explicit to ourselves, something that we have like, com like com consciously decided that this is a value I want to commit to. And they're intrinsic in the sense of that they provide their own justification. So they don't like need any justification beyond themselves, but the value itself is kind of like its own justification. You know, for example, happiness is often used as an example here, you know, that if I go out and do something and then somebody comes to me and asks, why did you do that? And I said, I thought that it makes me happy. Then like no further explanations are usually not needed. That it's like, it's an, in a, like happiness seems to be something that we value as such. We don't need like any further explanation for why we are pursuing happiness. So like these intrinsic values then are like that if we are able to like identify some intrinsic values in our life, then like the fulfillment of these values would be make our lives worthy and meaningful. And what I'm kind of like arguing that, like, that in trying to identify what could be like good intrinsic values for ourselves, we would be very well off if we like trying to align them with, their, with these psychological needs. Because like these could like actually provide some kind of like justification for why we value these things. So let, let's take an example here. So contribution is quite often thought as like one kind of like intrinsic value. It means this positive contribution beyond myself that I am able to make through my life. So feeling that I have like some kind of like con somehow contribute to the humankind or the nature or whatever. And when we think about our intuitions about meaningfulness, what makes life meaningful? I would argue that many of our key intuitions about meaningfulness are actually about this sense of contribution. 
So usually like when we list like who are people who are like have led like exceptionally meaningful lives, then people like Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, Marie Curie, Abraham Lincoln come to mind. And these are often like in the lists of people, like examples of people who might have led like ex exceptionally meaningful lives. And what unites them all is the fact that, you know, they made some like exceptional like, contribution toward the humankind. The same thing that if you think about, you know, prototypical examples of meaningful occupations, you know, the occupations that come to our mind usually like, are firefighters, nurses, doctors, which are like occupations where like the, the contribution towards other people is like especially salient. We actually like occupations where you actually like saving other people's lives. So I would argue that it's actually like, quite hard to find thinkers who would state that saving other people's lives is not meaningful. So, no, I guess like if you like put, I don't know, if you would like raise hands here, who thinks that like saving other people's lives is ha meaningful? I would think that most hands here would, would like raise. So if you're somebody opposed, you can like raise your hand now if you think that it's not <laughs> meaningful. <laughs> yes, peer, peer pressure works always. <laughs> so, but anyways, like, so I, th I think that that's something that, you know, that whoever we asked, so about like what, what makes life meaningful, almost everybody like would agree that you know like when we are able to contribute towards other people some, in some ways, that's something that makes our life more meaningful. And I'm not arguing that you know contribution would be like all there is to meaning. There are also like other intuitions about meaningful things that make life meaningful. Like for example, artistic expression would be like something that might not in involve contribution, but which we might still find meaningful. But it's a significant part of like our intuition about meaningful meaningfulness. And contribution also seems to be something which is like intrinsic in the sense of like it doesn't need justification beyond itself. You know, if, if you ask like why did I help certain person and say that because I care about that person. That sounds like, sounds like you know, that's, that's enough of a justification. I don't need like, you don't need like any more justification beyond, beyond the fact that I care about that person and because of that I wanted to help that person. So contribution seems to be like this like one intrinsic value and the fact that it's like such a, such a strong intrinsic value, I argue, is like, like has, has to do with the fact that there's also like this benevolence, which is like, which is a both potential need that humans might have. And there's like quite much research like nowadays about this like benevolence as a potential need. So it means like this having this positive impact in the life of other people rather than negative impact. And there's like you know lots of research showing that you know. It, like when, when we are able to help other people, it like increases our, our sense of well-being, short-term well-being. Like, and this, this, there have been like, you know, like this, there was this one recent meta-analysis of some like 20 plus studies, which all, all had like somehow like experimentally manipulated this sense of pro-social, that, that, that this pro-social behavior, and that which showed that, you know, like, that quite consistently, when we are exper experienced that we have this pro-social impact on other people, that increases our own sense of well-being. Then there's other research showing that it, it even has like some long-term effects. It, it like affects our like long-term well-being, our long-term health, and long longevity. So that people who, people, especially people in the late late life, who are like able to contribute in various ways, you know, volunteering or taking care of like some people close to them, these people tend to live longer than people who are like not not contributing in the same way, even after controlling for various back factors like you know like their their own like health status and so forth. There's also research showing that you know like this. That the, when we are able to like, contribute towards other people, it also increases our sense of meaning in life. There's like several studies also showing that, and many of these key findings have been like also like cross-culturally validated. So they have been not only studied in the in the Western countries, but also like in countries in Africa, countries in Asia, and so forth, showing that you know that it's it's not just like one culture that where where this effect seems to take place, and. There's also like one, one could like build this evolutionary rationale for why we have that, why human beings have this like this disposition to want to help other people, and we don't have to time time to go into that more. more. But like, if in the 70s, then like evolutionary researcher might have the argument that you know like the, because the gene is selfish, then all, all human beings must be selfish. I would argue that nowadays, if you look at like the now the discussion within the evolutionary research nowadays. Most researchers would agree that you know there seems to be this that that there are like mechanisms that can explain how creatures like human beings could have could have like evolved this disposition to want to help to help other people. It's like not this blind mechanism that we want to help all the people all the time, but it's more like a selective thing that you know, which is like, uh, for example, like the more close we feel feel to other people, the more prone we tend to be like tend, tend to help help those people. But like without going further into this like, evidence, one, one could like say that you know that a fairly strong case can be built now for why humans would have evo an evolved disposition to want to help other people under certain conditions. 
And of course, there's like there's, there's like many open questions still in the science. Like science is never like finished. There's all all, all sorts of things that could be, still still be like tested about this thing. But still, I could I would argue that there's there's like also like some other candidates for like basic basic psychology and needs like sense of belonging that Roy Baumeister has been writing about. But benevolence is one of the more robust candidates along these like. Like it's, it might not be the most robust. I think like this belonging, it might be the most ro most robust candidate at the moment. But benevolence is also like among these candidates for what could be this what could be like this basic human needs. So accordingly, then like this contribution as an intrinsic value could then be like aligned. If it would be like aligned with this sense of benevolence as a potential need, it would like like certain certain benefits. It could like actually explain the intuitive appeal that this contribution have. If it's a basic need that we have, then, then it, like, it can like help, to, help to explain why we feel so strongly about this, this contribution as a value. It can also explain why it's so widely shared, why it's not just us, who, or why it's not just me who values it, but it seems to be everybody around me seems to value it as well, even people coming from like various cultures. And it, even like if it's a need, potential need, it even provides some reason for like reflecting end, endorsement of this contribution as a value. That even, after, even when we reflect about the value, we will, might know that, okay, it seems to be about, about a value which like which leads to positive consequences, both for the individual in, engaging in these contrib contributing activities and also for the people who are like, who, who the person comes to support through these activities. So if you ask the question like, why should I value contribution? And, and we want to like remain within this like substitute framework. How can we answer this question? Like what, what kind of justification can we give to people? Like why should they value contribution in their lives? So like, like we can give like justification like because you already intuitively value it. Whether you want it or not, it actually is part of your value framework already. And it, it even like feels like so strongly to be part of your like value framework that it's, it will, feels worthy enough to base one's life on it. It seems to be like a value that we want to like commit in our lives because we feel that it's like worthy cause in a, in a very strong way. And also because there is no good reason to not value it. We have, we, we have, there might be like some, somebody, some wrong reasons like to not value it in certain situations, but like on average, like there's more reason to value it than, than reasons to not value it. Then like we can say, we can also say that, you know, because we all value it, it's not just you, but it's, it's we all who value it. We can, we can say that because valuing it tends to lead to good outcomes for, for both you and for the society. And we might be able to say that because we all support you in valuing it of it and we admire you for valuing it. And I would argue like, you know, these are already like quite, quite good reasons for valuing contribution. So like, you know, and, and finally, like, you know, there's a reason that because you could not value it even if you, not, if you would, would want to not value it. So you're not, not able to escape valuing contribution. So in, a, so in a way, like I'm arguing, like you know, these are like better reasons than like than, than an abstract belief in it being somehow like objectively valuable. So like to conclude, then. So what I'm trying to what I have been trying to argue here is that first that you know, the quest for meaning of life was like 19th century invention. It was like the reaction to this disenchantment of the cosmos brought by the scientific worldview, and it was kind of like this quest to identify some kind of like objective meanings within a worldview. Where, where the possibility for objectivity was already like seriously challenged. And that's why it, it might, might not be like so su successful often. And then there's like this separate question about meaning in life, which is like this fundamental question of the subjective worthiness of my own life. And here the aim is like to identify what factors make people to experience their own life as somehow like meaningful, worthy, worth living. And as regards like what could make then our lives meaningful, worthy, and worth living, I will argue that this contribution is one of the prime candidates for like what kind of like intrinsic values can actually make our lives feel like me meaningful and wor worthy of living. And I, I, I also like arguing that it derives its wide and intuitive appeal from the fact that it's based on a basic human need. And it's like a more, more generally like beyond this like contribution, I'm arg arguing that these intrinsic values Crowded upon these basic psychological needs, like would be like quite good things because they they would provide the most robust, intuitively appealing, and widely shared sources of value and meaning in life. So like it might, it might, it might like provide this like good balance between this like this rigid objectivism on the one hand, where like meaning is something given to us from the outside, and then also like uh, and between this like anything goes, where like wh whatever you happen to prefer is like meaningful for you. So like th they might be like able to provide this like middle ground between these two two positions. 
And what I'm, like contribution might be one of the prime examples of these intrinsic values, but I'm arguing there, there might be other, other values like that, which, which are like, important for our sense of, like, sense of meaningfulness. And identifying such intrinsic values requires a collaboration between philosophy and psychology. And that's why I like, wanted to talk about this topic here today, when we have like, both philosophers and psychologists present. So like, to summarize, what I'm like, kind of, like, suggesting is that instead of a cosmic meaning of life, Let's identify the meanings in life most suitable for us human beings. Thank you.